It's Thursday the 2nd of July 2020 and we welcome you to a tilt webinar with Florence Lyon, c'est ça? Lyons, I've got an English Lyons. <laughs> <laughs> I know it's Florence, Florence. Um, on the use of an online collaborative writing platform when providing feedback. Um, I'm Helen Myers, I'm chair of the London branch of AWL, and I'm very, very happy to be hosting this. It's particularly Joe Dale, though, who has done all the scouting and found all these wonderful people to speak to us. Joe, would you like to speak to us? I would love to speak to you. So, um, yes, uh, we're absolutely delighted that Florence has um, come along this evening talking about um, uh, 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 feedback, particularly in, in the context of um, Google Docs, but it could be in relation to other uh, word processing um, tools. And uh, it's really fascinating to hear uh, Florence's findings from her PhD. Um, so we're very, uh, really delighted that she can be here and she's going to be speaking to us from the future because uh, it's now just after, or yeah, just after seven o'clock in the morning in New Zealand. Uh, and so, uh, and as you can see, uh, Florence is in school. So I, I can't wait for uh, Florence to get started. But also I am a independent languages consultant. I do make a living out of uh, webinars. Uh, so this is completely free, obviously, but I have put in the chat um, a selection of example sessions if you would be interested in uh, inviting me to do a paid webinar for your department then please do let me know um, and there's a whole range of choices there of things that you can uh, be uh, be asking me to do. Over to you Helen. Thank you. Um, from AWL's point of view we would love it if you could now use this as a time to write in the chat if you are a member of the Association for Language Learning Tell us that you're a member, tell others that they've got to join and tell them why they have to join. That would, that would be great. Um, as Joe said, this is all done free. We're so grateful to presenters who give of their time to do this. Um, but obviously it does cost money to pay the Zoom and all that sort of stuff. And um, it's just nice if people all join in and uh, chip in a bit by being a member. And you get 10% off if you join using the code webinar10. So if you want to know any more about it, do you know, ask anybody who's, I'm hoping in the chat saying that they're a member, and please do join us. It's been lovely to see the number of people who've joined us as a result of these webinars. Um, so as I've said already, go onto our AWR London site, and that's where you've got a list of all the webinars that, that have been happening. We've had, I don't know, about 34 or something since the lockdown. It's gone really, really well. And I know we've got more than this coming. Um, apologies to Joe that I haven't got around to doing all of the um, adverts for them, but Joe, do you want to tell us what's coming up? Uh, yes, sure. So um, we've got um, on July the 4th, so on Saturday morning, we have Paul Rain, who's going to be beaming in from Japan. So he's a university lecturer in Japan, and he's going to be showcasing um, a, a website which he has created, um, uh, which originally was designed to be used in EFL, but he's actually tweaking it so it's um, appropriate for MFL teachers. So what he's really looking for is lots and lots of feedback about the site, which I think is going to be a really interesting session. And then um, we also have the uh, AWL Summer Social on July the 11th. And I've sent um, Helen a list of different Ooh. things that we've got. So I, can, I, can, I haven't put it on the I can, No, don't worry. I can reveal this, uh, re reveal this now. So this is, it is the first time that you would have heard this. So here we go. So um, I'll try and say it nice and slowly. Right. So on the 6th of July, we have Emma Ferris, who's going to be talking to us about book widgets, which some of you may have heard about but she's a book widget ambassador, which sounds a very cool title. And she's going to be uh, saying how it can be used in MFL. So she, uh, all these people are either MFL teachers or English language teachers. On the 9th of July, we have Claire Wilson or Leo Languages, um, titled to be confirmed, but she's certainly going to be talking about lots of interesting things, um, including liveworksheets.com, which is a cool website. On the 14th of July, we have Graham Stanley, the Graham Stanley, um, who is a very important person, also a very nice person, and he's going to be talking about interactive storytelling. So a sort of like a skate room type um, environment um, around yeah, interactive storytelling. And uh, he's looking for uh, five Hispanists um, to take part as guinea pigs. So I've got a couple of people in mind, but if you'd like to volunteer yourself, if you're a Hispanist and you'd like to do a, like a live session and, and then everyone else watches as it were, then that'd be really, really awesome. Uh, on the 16th of July, we have Carmen Scoggins, who is a very, also a very nice person who is going to be uh, beaming to us from the States. So she is either the current or a past president for SCULT, which is sort of like the equivalent of AWR London uh, in the States. And um, she's going to be talking about, is it time to reboot or recalculate? So that's sort of the idea is, you know, how do we prepare ourselves for uh, the new uh, year, new academic year? On the 18th of July, I think this is still going ahead. We're going to do the tilt show and tell. 
Um, so that'll be Saturday night. Um, so we'll be looking for volunteers to speak at that. We'll uh, put out a Google form, what have you, for volunteers for that. On the 21st of July, we have Michel Laroche, who is head of languages at um, Showbury Ness High School. I think I've pronounced that correctly talking about Seneca learning for MFL. So I thought that'd be a really useful thing um, to do. So I asked Michelle to do that. Um, although that's not the official title yet, we're gonna have the official title later, but it's, she's basically looking at Seneca learning. On the 25th of July, I'm actually delighted about this one in particular. Uh, we have Melissa Gould Drakeley, who's a very, very important person, uh, who's basically the, 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 languages, uh, the languages lead for the Department um, of Education for New South Wales. So a very important person. I've known Melissa for a number of years. Um, it, that's going to be at 10 o'clock in the morning on the 25th, which is a Saturday. But she has said she's not allowed to have the session recorded. So that will not be recorded. So if you want to come along and watch it live, brilliant. But um, you will not be able to have the recording for that because officially she's not allowed to record it. OK. Um, and then on the 28th of July, um, which will probably be the last one for July, uh, we have Sophia Mavridi who is also a very nice person, who is um, uh, for, uh, a lecturer at the, uh, Leicester de Montford University. And she's also the head of the Learning Technology Special Interest Group at IATEFL. So, and she does keynotes all around the world. She did a keynote for uh, uh, the British Council in Mexico, uh, whenever that was a couple of months ago. And she does keynotes here and everywhere. So she's also a really, really fascinating person to hear from. So. Those are all the, the upcoming um, uh, sessions, so lots to look forward to. And once we have uh, complete titles, we'll obviously let you know. Okay, so as you see, something just went wrong with my, um, my share. So if you could just bear with me, please, while I get it back again. So. Um. Okay, am I there? Yeah, all good. Okay, so that's coming soon. Um, we have an etiquette. Basically, we're professional and we're kind, and we're very happy to host speakers and participants free of charge, um, and they are responsible for what they have to say. So now I'm going to pass over to uh, Joe to introduce Florence. Fantastic. So as I said already, I'm absolutely delighted that, that Florence has um, agreed to do this webinar. I first uh, met Florence um, online, uh, surprise, unsurprisingly around 2008 I think it was when we took part in what were called flash meetings MFL flash meetings so flash meetings uh, flash meeting was a tool developed by the Open University you needed flash for it there's a clue in the title and uh, back in the day lots of um, language teachers particularly from the UK but occasionally people from uh, from further afield uh, took part in um, uh, yeah just uh, uh, yeah just sort of discussing ideas basically so we were really you know uh, um uh, 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 leaders in this field in that way i think so that's really fantastic to see and i got to know uh, florence and um i think i'm right in saying florence you taught in the uk at the start of your career is that right yeah, yeah. I, I was actually trained in mfl in the uk there we are that's great so i'm sure you'll talk about that in a, in a minute but then i actually had the pleasure of meeting florence face to face in 2018 at the NZALT conference, um, which officially would have been starting tomorrow, but of course, because of the coronavirus, it's been cancelled. Um, but um, no doubt that will be rescheduled for, for next year. Um, so, so it's my absolute pleasure, my absolute pleasure, Florence, that you're doing this. And because of the the, the fact there's a lot of interest in research-led um, uh, teaching at the moment, I think that there's going to be lots of interesting comments in the chat. So do please ask as many questions as you would like. and. Um, I'll obviously not to not try to interrupt Florence's flow too much, but I will ask uh, Florence these questions and we can have an, a really good academic chat about the role of feedback in the modern foreign languages classroom. So over to you, Florence. I can't wait to, to, to hear all the different findings. Oh, and I put in the chat as well uh, an interview that Florence did for Education Perfect on their podcast, which is uh, episodes, it's called, with the capital E and capital P at the beginning, which is episode what it might well, anyway, it's one of the earlier ones episode three I think, I think it is was it number yeah, one I think actually it was the first one okay so the first one so if you if you check out the podcast episodes um first episode and then I think it's about half an hour I remember listening to it while I'm having my my lunch a few weeks ago and I thought I've got to ask Florence onto the tilt webinar she'll be amazing so that's a really nice introduction um in the in the podcast but we've got Florence live now live from the future in New Zealand, in her school, and over to you, Florence. Yeah, good morning. So it's 7.15 and 
I am here at school all alone. So um, you need to be nice with me because I've never done that before. Um, so I'm uh, starting my PowerPoint. Fantastic. Okay. And tell me if things don't work. Um, I think it's quite important before I start speaking about um, my doctorate is that I tell you why I made a crazy decision of starting a doctorate while teaching. Um, so we have to come back a long time. When I was about eight, um, my primary school teacher then was only trained to teach one class at a time, you know, like, so, um, no, sorry, not, yeah, I was eight years old, yes. So, you know, like year one and year two and so on. And um, the last year of her career, she was asked to teach a combined class, um, which in France was C1 and C2, so which is, I think, year two and three together. And because I'm a nerd, so I was a good girl, she um, asked me to sit down next to a boy who was not as, um, as was not succeeding as well as I did. And so one day I remember that vividly. Yeah, I've asked him, we were doing maths, and I asked him, did you do your homework? And he said, well, no. And so I told the teacher and I said, well, I cannot help him because he doesn't do his homework. Back then, I thought that it was a choice that, you know, you were all doing your homework or you were not, and that you decided if you wanted or not. And then uh, when I became a teacher, I realized that um, I had started the race um, in a very different way than that boy did. I can't remember his name was William, um, because I was lucky that at home I had nothing else to do but doing my homework and I got some help and that education was valued at home. And now being a teacher, I realize that. I would like to go back in time and say actually to William, well, I can understand that you didn't want to do your homework. It was not a choice. Then as a teacher, uh, here uh, in, in this school, actually, I was having um, a cuppa at interval uh, with other teachers and they were talking about a boy. And I didn't know who they were talking about. And I said, oh, what's, you know, what's his family name? And I was told, well, you don't know him because he's not clever enough to do French. And suddenly it hit me that some teachers would think that some kids are worthy or not of learning. And I didn't know, like, what well, just because so if you succeed, then you're worthy. And if you struggle at school, then you're not worthy. So this is why I've started um, this crazy journey of doing um, a doctorate to find a solution to support those kids who come ill-prepared to school. So I, um, I did it in feedback. So I did a master's um, on feedback here in New Zealand. And what I found out during my research is that the teachers were unconsciously rewarding students who were already working very well with technology tools and with feedback. So if you were working well, you will receive tons of feedback and the use of technology. And if you were struggling, you didn't get any feedback because the teacher didn't see the point. So here we are. What is effective feedback? So feedback is um, what supports a student to go from what she already knows to something that she needs to learn. So it's something that supports the student to cross that gap. It has to be timely, which means that you need to, to give feedback to a student when the task is being done. So if you give the feedback, uh, feedback to a student of a task that has been done the term before, there is no point to that. It has to be um, set Fl to Sorry, Florence, can I, can I just check with you? Um, can we, are we supposed to be seeing your screen? Because you're not yes. sharing your screen. Yeah, you haven't shared your screen yet. Can you? Okay. Okay. Don't worry, it's, because, it's absolutely fine. Yeah. I told you I'm very beautiful. You are, you're lovely, Florence. <laughs> well. <laughs> there we are, rock and roll, that's it. There wow, we are. Pop, pop. If you go to from beginning. Oh. Or from, okay. from current slide, yeah, that's uh, yeah. It. Okay. okay, that's it, so, lovely, thank lovely. you. Um, so it also has to be set against criteria, which means that you cannot just give feedback on whatever you feel like. It has to be done towards something that you've asked the students to work on. So for example, if I ask my students to write something on past tense, 
I cannot give feedback on future things or something that we've got no idea what I'm talking about. So it has to be against, uh, set against uh, success criteria that the students have access to. It has to be explicit, which means that it has to be um, given in a language that is understood by students. Um, so the language has to be understood by everybody, not just the kids who have got already a very high level of literacy. It has to be personalized because I am not like you, so I want to have a feedback that it belongs to me and to my, um, to my task. So it cannot be a feedback to the whole class. Here, of course, when I'm talking about feedback, I'm not talking about uh, behavior feedback, you know, like, oh, you behaved well in a class. It has to be dialogic. It means that um, a conversation needs to happen between the teacher and the student. So, you know, like when we will, we will look at something, we will have back and forth um, conversation where the student can ask questions and, and you have to be sure that it has to be understood. Now, for this um, study, I was mostly interested, I, think I was interested, should I say, on teacher and students' feedback, that relationship. I was not interested in peer assessment. So that could be something else, something that I do later on. But I had read that um, students prefer receiving feedback from teachers because they know that teachers know more than they know themselves. Um, so that's why for this study, um, and here today, I'm only going to talk about that. But feedback does not happen. Why? Um, it's because of lack of teacher's knowledge. So teachers are able to say if um, a piece of work is good or not, so they can easily give a grade, but they, are, they find it very difficult to um, tell the students what needs to be done next in order to um, get better. Also, because feedback is time consuming. If you teach 30 students and you've got five classes, I'm quite bad at maths, but I know that's a lot of students. And if you have, need to give timely personalized feedback, it's, you cannot do it. So you end up prioritizing it, which means that your best kids will get feedback and the kids that you think do not need, you know, you don't give them. Also feedback can be ignored by students. It means that Sometimes students will get feedback from, as I said, the term before or a task that they finished. So they just ignore it because they know it's no point. And also because they cannot understand the language used in the feedback or they cannot understand the handwriting of the teacher. Okay, so during my master's, I was um, introduced to Basil Bernstein. Um, and I've got this um, love-hate relationship about Basil Bernstein. Um, I love him in the sense that everything that is um, wrote make, um, allows me to read anything that I'm reading now in my career through his eyes, and it does make a lot of sense. But my first, the first book that I read from him, I could not understand a word. Like, it was not an English barrier here. I couldn't understand every word, but put together, it didn't make any sense. And so I um, looked at other books and other academics saying the same thing than me. So I thought, poof, at least not just me. Um, and he's, he's um, an English um, um, sociologist who um, followed Durkheim, so the French, the first French sociologist. Um, and is, it, Basil Bernstein doesn't have a great um, reputation right now because he's seen as um, giving a lot of um, um, deficit theorizing. Then I don't read it like that. I read that actually is offering a solution and that we just need to listen to what he has to offer. So here I'm going to present a few of his um, uh, terms, which they are all quite complicated. So you need to bear with me. Okay, one of these concepts is framing. Uh, framing, it's, it means it's the pacing and the evaluation criteria of a lesson 
and it's how teachers control what's happening in a class. And framing can go from weak to strong, and it depends what you want to achieve. So, for example, um, the framing can be weak to allow students to have a slow pacing. So, if you have a student that needs a little bit longer than other students, you need a pacing to be slower. But if you want to have the evaluation criteria very clear to the kids, then you have to have a strong framing. So that framing moves up and down all the time. Um, so here, that's, that's what it's doing. So it's going up and down all the time in the lesson. Is other concept uh, uh, codes. So that's where, that's why it doesn't have a good repetition. So. Uh, ben Chan said that there are two types of codes, elaborated and restricted. So restricted codes, you need to be um, um, familiarized with it. So for example, if I go in soccer, like a football match, I don't understand the word, so I will not understand their language because I haven't been um, given the rules of the language. And then you've got the elaborated code which allows you to access what was unthinkable before. At school, we are, we are using elaborated codes at all times because we are transmitting knowledge. So what needs to be taught and what needs to be learned is done through elaborated codes. At home, when you are relaxed uh, in your family, you are using the restricted codes. Now, students, who come from um, low social economic status use only the restricted codes. Then middle class um, students use an elaborated code at home and a restricted code. They, they can use both. So when, when they come to school, they actually understand the language that we are using because they are used to both codes. So our struggling students come only equipped with the restricted codes, which means that most of the time, even if we are not teaching a foreign language, what's going on in the class, it's like us listening to a language that we haven't ever learned before. They've got, they cannot understand what's going on, so they've lost that. Um, Bourdieu said something that I quite like that, is that um, it's like, Middle, uh, middle class students know how to play the game. They understood that at school, they understood the language of school, then the other ones haven't. So my research, uh, it was an action research, which means I wanted to work with the teachers, um, not just doing it on them, but doing it with them. We wanted to make sense of it all. It had four phases. So the first one was the baseline um, phase where I wanted to know what the teachers did in their class, what was their understanding of feedback and how they use technology. During phase two, we had um, um, a workshop together where we looked at feedback and persuasive writing and so on. And then I observed the classes and they provided feedback to their students. Phase three was the same than phase two but we've learned from what's happened during phase two. And then the last one uh, was um, when I, we just look at what happened and what were the evaluation of the research. So I was very interested obviously in feedback um, for the reasons I gave before, because feedback is the main, um, it's the most important change a teacher can do in a class to support a students. So, uh, in New Zealand, we talk about a lot about relationship, but to me, feedback is part of that relationship. Um, and also, I was interested in persuasive writing um, because persuasive writing is full of codes, hence Benstein, and it's um, a, um, a genre that is very hard to control, to learn, and but it's seen as supporting students to become inf informed citizens. So all that put together, this is what I did. I wanted it in the middle school because I didn't want, I wanted that the relationship between the teacher was not a variable there. 
I've asked two teachers in the middle school. So it was in um, New Zealand urban school, which is only 10,000 people, of course. Um, so the, the two teachers worked together in the year eight um, in a big hub. So it was 63 students across the two classes, 38 students participated. And also I've asked the teachers to identify 10 target students. So three students working above a standard, three um, students working at and three below. So in New Zealand, at the end of year seven, you need to be at early, um, sorry, I'd rather start again in Florence. At the end of year eight, you need to be at uh, end of level four in, in English curriculum. So here that's the dark blue bit of year eight. Um, so I just wanted to put this slide here so at least you know what I'm talking about when I'm talking about um, level. So in New Zealand, we've got a curriculum of eight level. Um, so right now in French, I teach from year nine to year 13 and they start at level one of the curriculum and end up at le level eight when they leave um, year 13. Okay. During the persuasive writing, the teachers have um, decided to use what they call the peer structure. So peer stands for point, example, explain, and recite your point. So each paragraph followed that um, structure there. And to start with, which was very interesting, is that students said that it made sense and that it was easy for them to understand. And they said that it, they it was easy for them to write all their paragraphs. That sounds ridiculous, but it was already a good point of supporting the kids in their writing. And the teachers created um, a persuasive writing rubric where um, you look at, at each level of the curriculum. So they had some kids leveling, working at level three, some kids working at level four and so on. So they wanted to show the progression of each level and something that was very good also is that they created a, a, a next step rubric. So showing the kids, okay, so if you are doing something like that at level three, this is what you need to do at level four and so on. And in a language that speak to the kids. Something that was very interesting is that the teachers did not feel comfortable, although they created it, they didn't feel comfortable to, uh, in using that in their class. And at the end of the study, the kids told me, oh, we actually would have liked that to use this every single lesson because it showed clearly what needed to be done. Okay, so uh, during phase two, the teachers gave um, feedback. And so they gave feedback on using Google, um, Google Docs. It's only Google Docs because the school were, it was a, a Google Docs um, school. It didn't bother me which platform. So at my school here, we are Microsoft, so you can do exactly the same. I was not interested in the name. This is why I didn't put Google Docs in the title of my doctorate, because I was in, interested in the tool. So here it's, it, comparison between written digital feedback and audio-based feedback. So the teachers said when they write the feedback on Google Docs, it gives them more space to write. So therefore, the quality and the quantity of feedback was better. They found it was more specific and much faster to provide feedback. So if you remember at the beginning of the, this um, PowerPoint, I was telling you that it has to be um, timely and personalized and on a continuous loop. Or, so you can see that if you are doing it on Google Docs, much better already than doing it on, on books. However, they said it did not make feedback more dialogical. And that's what I was interested in. Interesting point is that the teachers have said that they were trained and they were told by the teacher college to only give feedback to students when the, when the student is in the class with them. So when I came in, they were used to give feedback, but in the classroom, in, in the walls. So when they started writing on Google Docs, the next day they came to the kids and said, so did you understand the feedback I gave you last night? And so they had that conversation, but in class. So they even noticed themselves that it, it was something that they have to 
go out of this habit of doing it in class. Very surprisingly, uh, they didn't like giving audio feedback on, um, online uh, because they said it was time consuming. So they said that they had to think a lot about what they wanted to say, that they've done some mistakes, so they had to um, delete and start again and so on. And they could not multitask. So they could not watch TV and give feedback. That's what we do all the time. Um, so they and could not listen to music. So the only thing they could do was given feedback. So that's why they didn't really like it. Um, then, what about the students? So, the students said when they receive written digital feedback, they, they noticed it was faster for the teachers to provide the feedback. So, um, they've noticed that they didn't have to wait that long. And they also thought that it was clear because on Google Docs, when you put a comment, it highlights where you need to um, pay attention. So, the sentence or the paragraph. But when I've asked the students, so did you understand the feedback a little bit better? They said, no, uh, not worse, but the same. So if it was done on their book, on, the digi on, on Google Docs, they understood the feedback the same. However, for the students who struggle in literacy, um, they thought that audio feedback was much better. For me, the best is what when they said, oh, Finally, I understood what the teacher wanted to say, because they say that when they read, in the head, it doesn't sound the same than the teacher. So I felt, oh my God. So finally, they were in the class that they understood what was going on. So until then, they were good kids, doing what they were supposed to do, but it was all like a foreign language to them. And But finally, they understood. But the students who were very good at literacy, we did not struggle, thought that actually receiving audio feedback um, was um, too long, was very boring. They said, oh, we can actually read faster than what we can listen. And they said that they had to listen all the recording, then they were only interested in a few points. So maybe that's something that with your class you could, um, you could check. When I talked um, with the students about the rubric that they received, so that's what I was saying earlier, that the kids thought it was good because they knew what levels would be good and at what level, levels sorry, they should work towards. And it was the exemplars as well that they were given, which is funny because sometimes we don't give, but in New Zealand we are, not, we are told not to give exemplars to kids. Um, um, they said that they were more, more explicit, so they understood what needed to be done. And also, it was um, pushed themselves, so they knew, not only they knew how to go there, but they felt like they had to go there. And as, as it's written there, it's what they should aim for. So I thought it was very interesting. Um, now, about the persuasive on Google Docs, as I said earlier, they said what they liked as well is that um, it autocorrects. So, you know, when you type, you make a typo, it does it for you. They've also noticed that the work is done faster and 80% it helped them redrafting their work, which is obviously the most important thing when you are writing. Okay, so now, about the feedback they received. So on the left-hand side, you've got phase two and on the right-hand side, you've got phase three. So I didn't write tons of numbers. We don't really care. We can just look at the colors. Um, you can see, on surface language features, it means, you know, like uh, put a full point here, you should put a comma. So things that actually do not help for the persuasive writing. Um, the kids who struggle the most with writing got tons of that kind of feedback. And if you look, the deep language features, which actually help for persuasive writing, they didn't get at all. Like, I mean, a little bit, but the big difference you see is that the teachers we're expecting the students to work at a lower level, but they were helping the kids, the students in red, the one we were already comfortable in writing. So when I pointed out to them, when we looked at the results, they were horrified. So in phase two, you can see that students who were struggling with writing got a lot more deep language feature um, feedback. So that was quite important for me.
Um, so, as I was saying, we had some challenges during the investigation. The time consuming, that was the worst. So the teachers said that they were going to um, prioritize who gets feedback. So we understood that first, obviously, the target students, because that was for the investigation. But then they, start, they gave feedback to the kids we needed the most, so the struggling kids. And then the kids we needed the less, which means the kids who were already quite good at literacy. Now, at the end of the investigation, uh, the teachers felt empowered. They said, oh, to me, oh, finally I understand what writing is about. I feel more confident in giving feedback, but also we felt more confident in teaching um, writing. And also, um, they told me that they were going to use this program as an extension for the next year, so for 2019. Now, what about the results? Okay, so at the end of year seven, you can see um, that we had a lot of students working at below level. So the expected level that they were supposed to be at year seven. At the end of year eight, so from at the end of this investigation, you can see that the students working above level is much higher. And you can see a, a big shift now for the kids who are working at, still working below level at the end of year eight, they actually made an, um, a jump of two increments um, mini level in the level of the curriculum. So still their progress was gigantic. Um, for me, this, is, this shows that it actually works. So that's for the whole class, for the 38 students. Our target class, we've got the numbers here. And you can see at the end of year seven, nobody was working above level. And at the end, we've, we've got that. This is my reference, if you are interested. Um, so I hope it was clear because I had no question. Um, now, how can we um, apply all this theory in our classes? Am I still going to carry on? Yeah, 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 absolutely. Yeah, yeah. There's, there's, there's been no questions at all, Florence. So everyone's been um, oh. saying how, how interesting this is. So, for example, uh, Helen has been saying, Helen McFarland has been saying, the testaments are so revealing, the student's voice is very strong. Um, and let's have a look. And then people have been suggesting different, um, uh, different tools as well that you can use for audio feedback, uh, such as... Um, well, I mentioned Moat, but also uh, other people mentioned things like Loom. So it's like screencasting the screen and recording the, uh, the, the audio feedback for that as well. But I think it's absolutely fascinating. I remember being blown away on the podcast interview when you were saying that the, uh, the reluctant writers particularly benefited from audio feedback, which is really fascinating, I think. And, and yeah, that's exactly what the teachers say. They said at the beginning, like in year seven, if they found it very difficult to give feedback because kids only wrote this. And so obviously it's quite difficult, but then they were able to write this on Google Docs. Um, so then as a teacher, you've got more um, opportunities to give feedback. So here I'm going to look at some, some tools. And, and as you said, I didn't care about Google Docs and I didn't care about any um, tools in general, of course, except rubrics and exemplars. Oh, I realize I made a mistake, a spelling mistake on exemplars. I can't even understand in English why example and exemplars not spell the same. <laughs> um, um, so I think it's very important that students are given in every class rubrics and exemplars. Um, and, I, and I've realized as being a teacher here is that they don't. I, I, I don't understand because when you study yourself a university, the first thing we are given rubrics. If you cannot do anything, if you don't know where you are going, it's just insane. Um, and right now in New Zealand, we've got a very open curriculum, but we are asked by the government to create generic rubrics on, in our subject, which doesn't match with the curriculum. But obviously you see so much, it's so important. Um, also, the students need to know the success criteria. 
and it has to be clear. So during our um, investigation, the teachers use check mark, which um, was a Chrome extension. Now, I, and I just wanted to put it there because I wanted to be clear, but I've checked, it doesn't seem to exist anymore. Um, but um, I used one, I used a one not in my class, and I'm going to show you how I use that. And Joe um, introduced me to Moat. I, I thought it was quite good. So I'm just going to show you some examples and I'm gonna need some help moving from my PowerPoint to OneNote. Okay, so this is just a picture of what um, check mark used to look like. So teachers were able to enter some comments like comment uh, bank. And then, so you had, for example, P for uh, punctuation or something like that. And so you could click on it. Um, but interesting, teachers told me that they started using this, but they thought it was not personalized enough. So we ended up just writing. And uh, this is um, a screenshot of my OneNote. So I took um, an, an, a text from Wikipedia, which is about French Hong Kong. And as you can see here on the right hand side, I have um, put um, an audio and I'm going to show you how to do that. I've also written something so we can do some uh, written feedback here on, on OneNote. And also, I like that I'm able to send back kid to the kids something online, like a revision. And this is what Moat look, looks like, which I thought was actually quite, um, quite good. I like the way that uh, he felt. So now I'm going to move to my OneNote. Okay, so, and you tell me if you're gonna see my screen. Huh? So this is um, a, a text, you know, that I've just um, copy pasted from Wikipedia, but when I over my mouth here, so we're, we're still in we're still in PowerPoint flow, uh, Florence. Oh. Is that right? So if you click no. on New Share, if you click on New Share in the toolbar, and then you select your OneNote if you have it open. No, I told you I was not good at that. No, you're fine. You're doing brilliantly. Ah, New Share. Yep. Yep. Oh, yep. I'm so used to use Teams. Teams there we are. follow me everywhere. We can see your OneNote now. That's perfect. Thank you. Cool. So this is, this is not a real OneNote. That's the OneNote that we use with another teacher, an English teacher, and we try a lot of things together before we do it with the kids. Um, um, before, so, we jump, before we jump into yeah. OneNote, we've got a question from the chat from Isabel. She yep. said, rubrics and success criteria seem quite similar. What is the difference, would you say? Oh, excellent question. Um, rubric could be, okay, so we are going to learn um, uh, past tense. Okay, so it can be very general, but success criteria will say, okay, what happens when you are in that level of the curriculum, but that you are achieved merit or excellence? So sorry, I'm using New Zealand term, like, you know, uh, okay, very good and excellent. So it could be that if I say, for example, j'ai allé, which is not right in French, that's an okay, but je suis allé, that's a good, and je suis allé with an E at the end because I'm a girl, that's an excellent. So the rubric is more general of what needs to be done. And the success criteria are examples of what the student's work would look like at each level. Lovely, that's perfect, thank you. Yeah. Very clear. So hmm. as you can see on my mouse here, I can over and the kids can listen to that. The beauty of OneNote is that I can type um, the, all the kids' book are there on my computer. So I can mark their work. I don't need to carry five times 30 books and I can do it very quickly um, from my lounge, okay? Um, here, I've given a, a written feedback. Have you thought of adding some past tense, whatever? And then my third uh, comments will be something that allowing the students to be more independent in their learning. So instead of saying to them, okay, you haven't put, je suis allé with an E at the end, although you're a girl, it's just to send them back to an online um, uh, resource when they can learn that themselves. Now, if I've done it properly. Okay, can you see a new text? So 
this is um, the text that uh, one of my students just done uh, last week. Um, he's, um, he's lovely. He's very, very cute, but he's in the learning support class. So he, we, we're not streaming anymore, but we have a special class when there's only 15 kids um, who are struggling. They're very, very, their curriculum level is very, very low. And so for uh, my other students, this would not be that good, but for him, it's gigantic. He worked very hard to be able to produce this. Um, so we supported him in class of planning his work, and then he wrote it by hand, he didn't type it. Um, so I'm going to give, give feedback to him here. So, so at least you can see what I'm doing. So I'm going to insert and an audio. And then I can say, um, oh, I can see Taron that you've done very well for, you've added an S a bleu for les yeux because you've got two eyes, it's fantastic. But I can see that for frisé, you haven't added an accent, although you need to, because if you don't, it sounds like frise. And then I stop. Now, my students can listen to this feedback. It's there forever. And you can use it the next time we are doing some work. And it was very, very easy for me to do. I can also type, um, I am impressed, if I can spell it would be good, with your work, you should check um, where to add accents and so on. And I could um, send him also a link from um, another place, from online. Or even better, I can ask him, have you thought about adding a justification? Because in New Zealand, we have to say the parce que, you know, like j'aime ma mère parce que elle est gentille, so I love my mom because she's nice. So for me, when I saw one note and the possibility that the opportunity that it give, gave me as a teacher and for my students, and so I can follow the kids and their writing um, instantly. So I'm, you know, um, and now I'm going to try to show you mode. So you need to be nice to me, or if not, Joe can show you. So ding, 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 new share. Can I just ask you while you're doing that, Florence, do you give yeah. one piece of audio feedback for one uh, piece of work in one note, or would you give a number of different audio feedbacks for the same piece of work on different points? What would you recommend? Would you re recommend one piece of audio describing all the points you wanted to make or different bits of audio <laughs> for each point? Yeah, good question. The thing is that if you do one big one, you have to be super precise. So. If I say to the students, for example, oh, you need to look at accents, what well, is, it's got no idea. Where, do you know what I mean? Especially, I mean, that's, this is a short text, but if you've got a big paragraph, in a, if I say to you, well, you haven't looked at, um, according the, the past participle, you're like, that's Chinese again. However, if I say to the kid, okay, I can see that you haven't accorded the past participle with, in that particular instance, then it's clear to the kids. You always have to think, am I as clear as possible to students? That's great, thank you. And also, I think that if you give a giant um, uh, audio feedback, then I'm scared that it's going to be um, too long to listen. Do you know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. after a while, the kids might be completely lost. So you've asked him to, to change five things. By the time that you explain the five, they've forgotten what was one. So maybe you can do by, by um, the most important thing first. So it could be, you do one feedback on the past tense, you explain that. When they've changed that, then you've got your second feedback could be about accent. Then your third feedback could be about punctuation and so on. But Lovely. also, things that are also linked to the success criteria. So if punctuation is not in my success criteria on my rubric, then I don't speak about that because there's no point. Okay, so now I'm going to go. Dun, 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 dun. I'm going to try to go. 
to my drive. Told you, teachers start arriving now at school, so it's going to become a bit slow. Okay, so I have downloaded the app, which is um, the extension, sorry, I meant the extension. Um, and it's the purple thing on the right, top right hand mm -hmm. side. Yeah. And here, I mean, you know better than me. So I, if I double click on dance here and I add a comment and I can say, well, maybe dance in French is spelled with an S. Can you explain why? And boom, it was done. I thought this was impressive. And boy, yeah. And then my um, my my feedback is there, and it's done so so quickly. I was super impressed by that. I cannot use it here in my school because obviously we're not a Google school, but I thought this was quite good. That's fantastic. Could you uh, click on the moat extension icon in the Chrome? Yeah. yeah. Can you just click on it? What, uh, just click on it. Can you see it says uh, enable voice transcription? Yes. Right. So can you, uh, yeah, that's fine. That's fine. Right. So that's enabled for French. So could you then go back and leave um, some French? Uh, audio feedback and we'll see if it transcribes it into French, which it should do. Très bien. J'aime beaucoup ton uh, devoir. And then click comment. Yeah. Yeah. There we are. Yeah, boya. And I also think before also, before you click comment, uh, it get, there's a little pen icon. Could you could you just do it again for me? Can you like another example? On I click on the purple thing. Yeah. yeah. Where the pen? And then ah. you need to speak in French. Sorry, oh, click sorry. cancel. Hello. Yeah. Right, and then yeah. if you could do it again, and then, but yeah. J'aime les escargots. Okay, now if you wait, okay. right, can you see the pen? Yeah, click on that. Yeah. So what that allows you to do, it allows you to edit the transcript the transcript's not perfect before it goes live. Oh, that's brilliant. Yeah, because it's brilliant. Yeah, that's, it. that's it. Oh. I didn't see that. I was quite impressed actually because I've I've, I've I've said which of the words could you have used my first comment and I did it in English and he actually understood my my accent. I thought, Ooh, that was quite <laughs> impressive. That's great. But I think from multi the multilingual transcription option is just amazing. They've just added that in the last month, I think. So it's really really nice. I think definitely. So yeah, I I am done. Awesome. Thank you so much. That was really, really interesting. Do we have any other questions in the chat? Oh, we have a question from uh, uh, Jesus. Uh, he says, do the students have two exercise books, one digital and the other in paper? No. Uh, you mean in for my, my investigation or here at my school? Yeah. Um, yeah I well, could you answer for, for both maybe? I can answer both. Mm. Okay, so at for my doctorate the um, kids had both like okay. normal accessing books plus they all had like a computer um chromebook and that school obviously here at my school it's on, all digital okay that's great for, for the for the moat extension i don't know if you've tried this i think i'm right in saying that these students would need to have the chrome extension installed in order to hear the audio back i have got no clue yeah, I think that's right. You'd have to check that. Everyone listening to this, you'd have to check that out. But I think I'm right in saying uh, that's the case. But I think actually, if you access it on an iPad, you get the link. And if you click on the link, you can hear the audio. Uh, I may be wrong, actually. I'm not sure. I'm not 100% sure. It, it might be if you have the, if you want to see the player, you'd need to have the Chrome extension. But I think if you don't have the Chrome extension as the student, then I think you still get access to the link. I think that's right. But you'd have to check that out. Yeah, right. I'm sorry, because I could not try, my students are not on Google, so I could not try that. No, that's fine, don't worry. 
Uh, so David has asked, once the feedback has been given, does it still work once it's been downloaded? Yeah, so because what's happening, David, is you're, you're recording the audio, it's uploading onto their servers, which are based in Europe. If you look at their policy around GDPR and privacy, um, then uh, it will be, it'll be there, but you can delete it. Um, there's a difference between the student's audio and the teacher's audio. So when you go to the website, um, if you want to, uh, yeah, you need, as a student, you need to say that you're below the age of 18. If you're below the age, age of 18, it means that the audio is automatically deleted after two weeks. But if you're a teacher, I think it's, they keep it for a year. Um, so you have to check that out. So it's designed to be quick and easy audio feedback. It's not designed to be there sort of permanently. If that's the solution you wanted, you would look, uh, for something else. For example, in a Google environment, you could use Google slides, record the audio using uh, a web tool like online voice recorder, upload it into Google drive, and then insert it into Google slides from there. Uh, or obviously one note in the way that Florence has shown if you're in a Microsoft environment. So there's different ways of doing that. But what I like, like about Moat is it's very quick and easy, but it's not designed to be, you know, it's not designed to sort of keep the audio there forever, as it were. It's just a quick and easy way of giving audio feedback. Any other questions? Lovely, you can make it, Christy, by the way. Delighted that you're here. Uh, let's have a look. Uh, I think that's everything. I think that's everything. Oh, um, did you find um, that audio feedback particularly helped dyslexic students? Did you have any sort of findings around that? No, um, because it's then it's too many variables. You know, like um, when you do a, a study, it has to be very, very precise. So that's not what I've looked into. But when I have presented here in, in New Zealand to uh, primary school teachers, actually they were interested. The teachers that are dealing with students who have got learning issues could see the potential. Okay, that's lovely. But I've, I've got no data on it. That's fine. Um, we've got a question from Laurence. I think I'm right. Well, the question is, do you know uh, if you write written comments in Word, uh, can they be turned into audio comments? So I said, there's not, there's not an inbuilt feature like that in Word, but you could use uh, Immersive Reader. So Immersive Reader as a Microsoft tool, you could then use that to select the... Um, uh, select the the comment and then have it read back to you in the target language because it recognizes the uh, if it's in a different language automatically but I'm not sure well I mean immersive reader is built into word but I'm not sure if you can just highlight you probably can actually highlight a text comment and then click on immersive reader but you're looking for the book icon in word um, so you'd have to check that out Laurence but there isn't there isn't as far as I'm aware an, an audio commenting feature like moat in word although there is dictation isn't there there's dictation in the sense that you can use your voice to write your text which is not the same thing it's not an audio comment but uh, yeah i'm sure microsoft will produce something uh for word but at the moment if you want to do this sort of thing you would do it in one note in the way that uh, florence has so uh, expertly shown any other feedback yeah. <laughs> let's have a look i think that's everything I think that's everything. So I think without further ado, if it's okay, if everyone uh, uh, turns on their microphones and uh, opens up their webcams and we can give uh, Florence a fantastic round of applause. And if there are any other things that you want to ask, feel free to do so as well. So if, if you all turn on your webcams, if you'd like to, me included. That's awesome. And uh, let's give uh, Florence a round of applause in New Zealand, speaking for the future. <laughs> Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> so um, I've given your Twitter account details in the chat. Um, can you just show your first slide again for your, does that have your email address yes. on it? Is that all right? Uh, I'm going to try again to do what? Well done. Uh, dun, 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 dun. And if you're happy to share your presentation, that would be great. Um, either now, or if you could give it to Helen, we can then put it up on the, uh, the AWL webpage because each, each um, presenter, each um, webinar, Helen very kindly does a, a web page for that webinar. So if you're happy to share your presentation, that would be great. So there, there are uh, 
couple of horses um contact details to, so I'm and, sure, I'm, uh, yeah go on Lahance, yeah. I, i've sent it to you last i think last night for me of course so you you're right yeah, i've got so it yeah got so it. is that okay that we publish Perfect. it on the is that all right lovely Perfect. so does anyone have any burning questions they want to ask florence about feedback based on their own context anyone at all wants to be brave come on the mic and ask a question anyone at all <laughs> okay so uh, okay in the chat kate's written do students generally engage more with the audio feedback uh, no what they told me but that was the same with written feedback though so they they told me they said i do what the teacher asked me to do and but they also tell me that it makes them think about what was asked mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but there was so yes the engagement happens in a sense that the work is amended but not a, a conversation does not happen if it's this was the question okay that's really interesting i mean one question that came to my mind was there's been a lot of talk uh, certainly amongst uk language teachers about um, whole class feedback in the sense that you would make um, a detailed generic feedback for the whole class and then just give everyone a copy of that. But it seems to be from what you're saying that what, chat, what actually works best is personalized feedback for each individual student, even though obviously that takes a lot longer to do, but that clearly is what seems to be working best. But I suppose some teachers might, might find that they're writing the same comment again and again and again in students' work. I mean, what, what, what's, what's your thoughts about that? Ah. So two things here, as I said, because the feedback has to be personalized. So therefore my learning is not the same than your learning. So in class, if, if we are 30, there is 30 different learnings. Um, I, for NCA, which is our equivalent of GCSA, we are not, I am not allowed as a French teacher to give feedback to the kids, only one feedback. So what I do, I go around this, I take the students work, I look at, at them and then I make a lesson on this is the kind of mistake that I've seen in your work. But I tell them, I said, I am not allowed to give you feedback. So the kids really concentrate on that because, do you know, because I'm not allowed. But now for my junior classes, I, I could not do that because they're all at very different level. So if a student needs to justify, maybe another student doesn't need to justify his writing. So therefore, it's, that doesn't work. This is why I said it's very time consuming. Also, in, in our staff room, when we get told off by our principal, I actually never know if it's for me or not. So you become very confused. You're like, is it me or is it him? Is, you know? So I don't really understand that. How can this work in the class? Yeah. It, it, it has to be, because it has to be personalized. And to me also, it means that, as you said, if a teacher keeps writing the same comment all the time, it means that the learning has not happened. So therefore, it's not a feedback for the kids, it's a feedback for me. So if I can see, if I teach 30 kids and the 15 of them haven't understood whatever, you know, accents or the past, past tense, well, it's not, they're not in the wrong. I am in the wrong because the majority of my students haven't understood. So therefore, then it becomes a feedback to me is that what can I do in my next lesson to change my pedagogy in order to have more kids who have understood what I was trying to teach. Yeah. What do you think about codes, using codes when you, um, when you give feedback? But for example, not just simple codes, like what we've got, we've got like a, we've got like a Word document and on the Word doc, like you, you've got like a sheet and then they've got a box and it says additional task. And what we've got, we've got another sheet where we put loads of additional tasks, but under codes. So for example, plus perf means, could you please, uh, or it's a little explanation, remember, this is the way you form the perfect tense. Um, this is an example of it. And then underneath, uh, we've got, can you please, in, additional, in your additional box, um, translate the following uh, verbs? And it will be, uh, I went. Uh, just to prove that if 
they, I don't know if I make myself clear, if they made loads of mistakes on the piece of writing on the perfect tense, on their additional task, what they are going to have is going to be plus perf. And then they've got the sheet, all of them, where on the plus perf, but this is depending, like maybe one person's done the perfect tense wrong, but then the next person's done the near future. So that's why I've got a big sheet with all the codes on it and what they can do to improve it. And for, for me and for my classes, it seemed that this had quite a positive impact on them because they kind of look to see, okay, so this is the way I formed the perfect tense. Can I quickly go and look? And we've got time in the lesson when we give them the chance to actually improve their work when they've done an assessment yeah. or something like that. Do you think that using this, it's going to work on the long term or do you think it will have? I, so again, I only can speak about what I really know. Do you know what I mean? Which I've spent time on. I haven't looked at codes, things like that. What um, you, you make a good point is that for the feedback to, to know that if the feedback has happened, you need to give, the, the students have to amend their work. And so you also need to give them time in class. So this is what you are doing and that's perfect. Codes, mm -hmm. I wonder, but again, this is just mm -hmm. my gut feeling. Okay, I've got no data on that. I wonder if it's very clear for the kids who struggle the most. Is it another way? Is it, do you add another language to it? Do you know what I mean? So yeah, yeah, yeah. For, the, for the kids who actually understand literacy very well, you can say to them plus perf and they would say i had the perfect tense also before i know where to go i remember that we've done that last week and so we can go back i wonder if already when you arrive in in, in the class if already everything is foreign to you and i don't mean because we teach mfl yeah. i mean the understanding of it mm -hmm. you add another um another language to it so I've plus just, yeah. two yeah, so yeah, now what you, idea. what you need to do, you need to look into your own, um, in your own class and, and see, you know your kids, right? So you know, you know the kids, if they are struggling, ask them, ask them if they actually understand what you're talking about. Uh, and actually, you could differentiate, you, you could differentiate the feedback sheets and you could do it depending on the ability. So you can do like lower ability kids, how you said the, top, the bottom sets and things like that. And instead of the perfect tense, probably they will not even know what, they, what you mean by perfect tense. You can just call it like, you can actually write, you know, could you add an past tense yeah. or something like that. Then maybe show them more examples than you will show to the high ability ones. And then maybe, mm. You just gave me a lot of good ideas now. I've got like 5,000 things going in my head. I know. That's good. Uh, you know, because what I see, the feedback. We yeah. Could, and, then, and then it could be like the, you could differentiate it and you could have it like, oh, yeah. Like for the higher and, ones, you don't even need to write the explanation of the perfect tense. You can put a link or you can put something. Now we're using Google Classroom or Microsoft Teams or anything, that would be quite a good idea. You can just send them and give them like a little task as homework to go and research it and come back and improve it. Because you remember what the kids in my research said. So the kids yeah. who were there, who were not struggling, they said, oh, you know, I understand all that. So they, they, it's easy for them to move forward. But every, for the kids who are struggling, you have to be super clear. So whatever we are doing, is it super clear? One good way as well, because I don't deny it, feedback is super time consuming. So we need to find a way of doing it without killing ourselves. So maybe for your top kids, doing a sheet where you, you give just codes might work perfectly. So therefore, you don't have to worry about them, which realistically in a class of 30 you've got maybe 20 kids who are doing very well then you've got five kids middle and you've got five kids who struggle so you're actually only ending up giving um if if a feedback, feedback in the sense that it's personalized and so on and timely to only five or ten kids mm. and the 20 other you tick the box you know tuk, 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 and you help them like that Mm. And that's what the teachers said. They said it was way too time consuming. So they have thought about that, 
how can I make it work? Because they realized the, actually the importance of giving effective feedback. So that's, but you need to look after yourself as well. Yeah. I've got a few ideas, so I'm going to really think about it. And I've got a few ideas. When I'm going to put something together, I will send you an email. Yes, please, please do. Yeah. That would be brilliant. This has been amazing, Florence. Thank you so much. I mean, one thing that comes to my mind, you were talking about um, that it takes longer to give audio feedback, which I, I totally understand. But did you get any... Um, any teacher saying they, they preferred the audio feedback in the sense that the feedback they could give was a lot richer and deeper as opposed to writing out their feedback? So I thought I was not expecting that because all the literature actually says it takes less time to do an audio feedback than to write a feedback. Like it's three times faster. That was the experience of those two teachers. Uh, but they didn't like it and they stopped doing audio feedback because it was uh, unmanageable for them. So, but that's their experience. What would be very interesting now, it's for other people or another school to see would be different. They were also year two teachers, so they had very um, little experience. So it could be that they don't feel comfortable. Like when I do audio feedback, I never re-record it. I don't have time for that. I just press the button. Then, but I don't care what the kids feel about me. Do you know, do you know yeah. what I mean? Yeah, exactly. So, yeah, you'd have to have a no edit policy, wouldn't you? Really, you'd have to. Otherwise, you you wouldn't have time. Yeah. And also, I mean, on one note, you can do video recording. That mm -hmm. could be another um, another mode. Some teachers at my school, when I said that to them, they said, "Oh no, no, I don't want just the kids to see me," which I thought was quite interesting because. The kids see me every day. Do you know? yeah. Yeah, <laughs> look yeah. at me, they know. Um, in, in the chat, Helen's made a couple of really good points. So I'll just read them out if that's okay. So she said, yes. some of my students like audio feedback as they say it is personalized, which is something which I've read when I've been reading about audio feedback as well. They like the fact it's, you know, it's the, it's the voice they know well, their teacher. Um, they say they can hear my voice and they are used to my style and they feel that I know their work, which is a really nice point. And then this, the first point, the earlier point that uh, Helen made uh, is here. Uh, I use Google Docs, add a new comment, then students have to engage with the feedback and click resolve. This is another level of positive engagement, which is also very nice, I think, isn't it? Yes. And, and you know that it has happened. Now, I am not an expert in Google Docs. What what is good or however it's for the students to teach them how to keep the feedback because tasks are always um the kind of the same do you know what i mean so if you are looking at writing what you did in the last weekend or whatever the what you the conventions that you are learning are the same so it'd be quite good to model that to the students to say you keep your feedback so next task you go back to the feedback that i gave you because that could be useful for this one. Yeah, that's a great point. And, and I think her name was Helen. She's very right. Um, and that's what, this is what I was expecting, that um, a lot of other academics have said that when um, feedback is audio recorded, everybody feels more comfortable. So the kids, the students have said that they felt that the teachers was caring more than in writing and more precise and yourself, you feel more um, uh, comfortable because you don't have the stress of the grammar making a mistake. Do you know what I mean? When it's written, it's there that it's a big mistake. Um, and also the language that you use when you speak is not the same than the language that you use in writing. Mm. And you've got the tone also. So if I say to you, um, uh, you know, come here, or come here, <laughs> very different. The tone here, you understand very clearly what I'm trying to say to you. Yeah. So when you are recording, I can see that. Yeah, definitely. When you were talking about Basil Bernstein earlier, it reminded, because I, I did my degree in linguistics and French, and I remembered uh, reading about Basil Bernstein. And as you say, in the, I think his work was in the 1960s, wasn't it? And he was criticized for this idea of restricted code because it, um, Lots of people basically said, this is not true. You know, you're talking about, you know, it's not true to say that working class children can only use restricted code. And in fact, that's, a, that, you know, that's irrelevant, irrelevant uh, to um, 
to, to, to actually how people are. So I think that's, that's why, I think presumably that's why you mentioned the fact that he, he was criticised a lot of the time. But it's, it's really he fascinating to hear your, your take on what he was doing. And he still is. So for example, in New Zealand, we are not in that direction at all. In research, we are in the research of relationship. And um, so we're not looking at that. So I know that my doctorate is not very um, popular in New Zealand. <laughs> On only in Auckland, which is very funny. Auckland, that's what they're doing. In, in the Wakato where I studied, nee, it's not the right words to use. Uh, well, on that point, um, the question was, what are you planning on? Um, uh, yeah, sorry, Laurence says, what is your next step in your research, Florence? Um, I don't know, because, um, well, I, to be honest, I started to apply to jobs overseas <laughs> just when COVID happened. <laughs> <laughs> right. Also, so I don't know. I've been looking, I, because, I, I mean, I love teaching. And, but I want to grow. And I think that I've done all my growing in New Zealand. So I'm actually looking to um, work overseas because I want to see other curriculum, other way of teaching. You know, I want to see another way. Um, so I don't know. I, I applied to a job in Singapore, but I didn't get it. So I don't know. <laughs> but so are you thinking of staying in secondary or are you thinking of going into higher education? Uh, I, where, wherever the wind will take me right now, because obviously oh. there are no planes. Oh. I don't know. Oh, Samia, can you? Uh, is it? I think it's that Samia, is it? Can you mute your audio? Let me just, yeah, I've just done it for you. There we are. Sorry, Florence, you were um, saying. So I've, I have got no idea. I would like to move into uh, maybe um, mentoring. I don't know, um, looking at, like, I mean, still teaching. I remember when I was trained in, in England, there was this job uh, in schools that could specialize, specialist teacher, where you could still teach a little bit and support other teachers. That's what I, I would like yeah, to yeah. do. I think. AST, advanced skills teacher, but that, yes. that, that, that uh, disappeared many years ago, oh. unfortunately. That um, was my dream job. But, um, but yeah. That, that's amazing. I think, unless there are any more questions, I think that um, we've had a really amazing uh, tilt webinar. Thank you so much, Florence, for uh, no, all your, you for uh, your expertise. Me. No, it's, it's our pleasure. It's really lovely to, uh, to hear you sort of going through your, your, your research. And also, I think, uh, in a way, my favourite bit is the bit at the end when there's been sort of, you know, this in, informal uh, questions and, and you've been brilliant in answering everyone. So in, in England, just to clarify, I'm sure people are being a bit nosy, where did you teach and do you, you did your teacher training in England? Is that right? No, I, I used to live in Kent. Right. I used to live in um, Chatham and in Who, and I also lived in Sheerness in the island of Shippey. Mm -hmm. And then I got trained uh, in Chelmsford. Okay. Then I got a job in Essex in, I'm trying to remember the name. I can't remember the, the name of the school. It was Gable Hall or Stanford Hall. Okay. Uh -huh. And so uh -huh. I used to travel every day from Kent. I could not afford to live in Essex. It was quite <laughs> expensive. Was and then so, so how long were you in England before you went to New Zealand? Three years. Okay. And okay. then I, I moved to New Zealand in 2004. And you've been in the same school ever since you've been in New Zealand, yeah? Yeah, okay. unfortunately, languages are not um, valued in New Zealand. Oh. We do a lot of sport, let's say. We do a lot of sport, a lot. <laughs> so, and, and as I said at the beginning, languages are said to be only for the academic kids. Some of my students are told you should not take French because you're not clever enough. So yeah. that's the, do you yeah. know what I mean? That's what happens. And, and the last question, if that's okay, Helen has asked, uh, where are you from originally in France, uh, Florence? You can hear, can't you? <laughs> I'm, actually, I'm actually from Corsica. And until I was um, 11 or so, I used to spend six months in Corsica to do my schooling and six months in South of France in Marseille. So that's why I've got this horrible Southern accent. That's lovely. It's lovely. Okay, well, we'll wrap up there if that's okay. But thank you so much. Enjoy the you so enjoy much. your day. I know you just started now at school, your your yeah. school day. But thank you so much for your time. Um, this has been amazing. It's all recorded, so lots of people that couldn't make it tonight will be able to watch the recording. But thank you so much, Florence, from Excellent. the bottom of my heart. It's been brilliant. Thank you. Yeah. And thank you for having me. No problem. Take care. Enjoy the rest <laughs> of your day, and uh, bye thank for you. now. Bye. Right. Sweet. Oh.